making their way in. I realize that we've been very occupied. We'll be very occupied the last two days, uh, today, yesterday and today. And then also tomorrow, when we go to the field trip, <clears throat> you will spend the whole day outside. And some of you will not have the opportunity to go to Villa sit town, Villa City, to Port Villa, to have a look at the maybe say handicraft section. So what we'll do is we will arrange free transportation for uh, those wishing to go and do some last minute shopping. It'll leave here at eight o'clock uh, uh, on Thursday morning. And then at 10 o'clock uh, Thursday morning again for two hours, you will be there. And then 10 o'clock, you will be picked up again to come back here. I am trying to arrange, I know that your checkout times here uh, is 11 o'clock. I'm trying to work with the management here to um, to give you another extra hour so that you can check out at 12 p.m. And then you will, um, uh, the transportation will take you about 12.30 uh, down for the airport. Uh, so I'm working with management. They need us because we give them business. So, uh, so uh, I'm going to use whatever diplomatic skills I have left and my uh, my bargaining chips to uh, make sure that you all have a twelve o'clock uh, checkout time. All right, and uh, Madam Moderator, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvan. So, thank you everybody for coming back, uh, and I hope you feel refreshed, uh, had some coffee, had something to eat. Um, so for the second segment uh, for this session, session three, uh, we'll be focusing on VNR preparation and mainstreaming ABAS. So let me uh, introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, who's Kenethia Douglas, who of course you all know, she, is, <laughs> she was also presenting yesterday. Uh, and Kenethia of course is the Senior Program Manager for Sustainable Development. Uh, technical Cooperation Unit in the Ministry of Planning and Development of Trinidad and Tobago. You you have. Thank you very much, um, Madam Moderator, and good morning to colleagues. Um, I am going to start my presentation this morning by looking at what are the key lessons learned and best practices to promote coherence in implementation of the SIDS agenda and other global frameworks, including um, the SDGs. So the first thing um, on the, my list that we need to focus on is policy integration and alignment. And I think that some of the things that I'm going to cover are things that we've already been discussing and things that would have also been presented by other um, colleagues before. So this was just going to be for um, emphasis. So policy integration and alignment, we know that SIDS often struggle to balance the global goals and their own national priorities. So issues such as limited resources, the small economies, um, vulnerabilities, external factors like climate change and economic instability are the things that make it difficult um, for us. So the best way forward is to create a national framework that aligns both the SDGs other frameworks and the SID specific issues highlighted in the ABAS. So by ensuring policies across different sectors, such as climate adaptation and economic diversification are working together, we can also support progress in areas like poverty reduction, health and gender equality. So another key factor is multi-stakeholder engagement. This was also mentioned before. So collaboration between governments, private sector, civil society, and international partners is a key for effective SDG implementation and implementation across other frameworks, especially um, the ABAS. So there are times that this sort of implementation is not always smooth. And one of the things that we can do to make sure that we are being effective in stakeholder engagement is encouraging participatory governance where all voices are heard. So that is especially our marginalized communities or marginalized groups 
making sure that we are incorporating locally commu um, local communities or community groups or women groups or UN um, youth groups, sorry, and making sure that they are able to contribute towards the um the process and that is one way of making sure that it is inclusive and coherent so also working on institutional coordination and capacity building so the lack of strong institutional mechanisms and capacity is slowing down progress especially when trying to coordinate across different sectors and ministries so one of the things we definitely need to start working on is strengthening interministerial collaboration and ensuring consistent monitoring and reporting and making sure that we are building capacity. Sorry, I lost where it was. Give me one minute, sorry. So building capacity, making sure that efforts towards increasing the human resource, especially within those um, institutions, focusing on growing local expertise in policy design, data collection, program monitoring, and nurturing leadership um, within key institutions. So it's all well and good. And this is something that we have always talked to our um, development partners about is it's good when we receive technical assistance, but our technical assistance should also translate into knowledge sharing and transferring of knowledge so that the capacity within the institution or organization or the ministry that you're working with has that um, capacity that remains within the organization so that the next time around that we have to do is something like, say, for instance, a voluntary national review, instead of reaching out to the UN again for another consultant to help with the report, capacity was built within that particular ministry to do that on their own. So it reduces the dependency, builds the capacity and creates stronger um, institution. So data monitoring and reporting. So as SIDS, uh, we are facing challenges with data collection. This is a topic that we've heard throughout all our discussions. And it's not just for SDGs, but it's across the different frameworks that we have to report on. And I would have mentioned yesterday that we, Trinidad and Tobago is addressing this by building a more robust data system. And we're really hoping to incorporate the MNE framework for the ABAS um, into this, um, making sure that we are establishing integrated data platforms using digital technology and enhancing partnerships with international organizations for data-related capacity building. So when I mentioned yesterday about our data repository, that is one of the things that is going to help us improve our ability to be able to report and capture the data that is related for um, sustainable development. So this is also going to play a key role in our upcoming Vienna reports. So the last thing under this um, particular topic is regional and global partnerships. So regional cooperation and support from global partners have already brought, brought sorry, um, significant benefits to SIDS, including Trinidad and Tobago. But I think there is still room for improvement, especially in reducing duplication of efforts. So utilizing regional platforms like the UN Multi-Country Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, that's the MSDCF, um, it is for Dutch and English-speaking Caribbean countries. So, um, sorry, lo siento, Cuba. <laughs> um, can be a visible uh, platform for knowledge sharing, technical support, and collective action to help SIDS work together more um, effectively. So consideration can be given to establishing a community of practice or discussion forum for the Caribbean countries to engage, especially on the ABAS. So this is something that Mr. Roach, you can take back to your RCs, because I think, <laughs> why are you laughing? We have to give them work to do. Because <laughs> I, I think it's something we can make the MSDCF a little bit more practical for, for countries. And if it is that 
uh, the ABBA is something that we now have to take on board. I think we have to see how our existing frameworks and existing mechanisms can be utilized more um, effectively to give support where it is um, needed. So the other question that I'm going to tackle is how can the ABAS be mainstreamed in the VNR process and how can the UN system and other stakeholders um, support? So the mainstreaming activities I'm going to mention. So yesterday I would have also talked about how we're going to be including a chapter in the VNR report that is specific for the ABAS. So what we intend that chapter to highlight is lessons learned from the implementation of the Samoa pathway. So Trinidad and Tobago would have undertaken through the support of the UNRC office, a uh, report on the national implementation of the Samoa pathway in Trinidad and Tobago. We got the support from the UN office to produce the report. The challenge that we've had why it hasn't been official as yet is getting the approval um, for it. So we're going through that process, but once we get our cabinet approval, we have a report that kind of lets us know where we have done well, where were the challenges, where were the gaps in terms of dealing with implementation of the Samoa pathway. So that is key lessons that we're going to be taking into what we have to set up and put in place for ABAS going forward. So as it's um the report would start would look at those um areas, help set the right foundation for achieving um the ABAS. So areas such as what are the key institutional and capacity gaps, um stakeholder coordination for implementation and monitoring and reporting tools and mechanisms will be elaborated because those things are important for um, implementation of the ABAS going forward. And the chapter will also touch on funding opportunities for programs and projects that can show progress toward achieving the targets that would be set out in the m and framework for the ABAS. So another point here is that it will also be important for partners such as the UN system, other development partners to conduct an assessment of both the UN's joint program of work and um, well, for in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, it's our government's public sector investment program to identify those initiatives that are aligned to the focus areas of the ABAS, because I think going forward, it would be important for us to be able to show what implementation is taking um, place on the ground and how it already aligns to some of the focus areas because we can appreciate that work is um, already going on. It is continuing. We just need to be able to make the assessment to show that, okay, what we have been doing so far aligns with these particular um, focus areas and then be able now to make, through the assessment, identify, okay, what other projects, programs, or initiatives we now need to implement as new um programs to now treat with the areas that are not already being covered. Um, the UN system and development partners should also work on integrating the focus areas of the ABAS into their work programs and country results reports. So the UN, through the framework that I mentioned before, the MSDCF, they produce an annual country results report that shows how the joint program of work between government and the UN um, is, um, what are the achievements? So I think now this particular report, Mr. Roach again, I think now the, um, the country results report needs to start showing progress, not just for SDGs, but the, um, the ABAS as well. And I would also like to emphasize that when this re particular report is being done, that it should not just be a superficial report, but it should also be evidence-based. So to the extent that we can actually show evidence of the implementation and the progress, and it's not just all qualitative, but some sort of quantitative assessment as well. I hope you don't feel like I'm picking on you. 
<laughs> um, so what was not done so well, and I would have mentioned this yesterday as well, was how Trinidad and Tobago would have integrated the Samoa pathway into our national strategies, policies, and plans. So the sustainable agenda for SIDS and its program of action is not one that was publicly um, disseminated in Trinidad and Tobago, nor I think on a whole that the SIDS agenda has the publicity that the SDGs was able to command. And I think that this is something that we need to change. And I think as national focal points, this is something that we should commit to doing within our respective countries. So there must be a concerted effort to make of us equal to the SDGs. And they must be both mentioned in the same sentence at the same time. One, you should not be having one conversation, um, a conversation about one without the other. At one of the panel discussions during the interregional preparatory meeting in Cabo Verde, looking at the operationalization of the SIDS outcome, ensuring localization and coherent implementation. I made a contribution which emphasized that we need to keep Abbas alive. So it needs to be part of the conversation in every forum, at every meeting, and highlighted in every speech. So we need to ensure that our political leaders are supporting the Abbas as well. And we also need to drive home to the international community. And this is us as SIDS that the Abbas is important to us and ensure that we are organizing ourselves as well to receive the support and also make full utilization of it. Another point on the mainstreaming activities here is cross-sectoral collaboration and coordination with national actors and the UN system during the VNR process, and that would help produce a more comprehensive report. So the question would have also asked what um, sort of support or how can the UN system and other stakeholders support? So specifically the UN system, um, technical assistance in the form of capacity building support to develop the necessary tools and expertise for integrating the focus areas of the ABAS into VNR reporting through workshops, training, or in and advisory capacity. The UN system's wide reach would be able to share global best practices and frameworks on how countries are using new programs of action in reporting processes. So it doesn't have to be how other countries are doing uh, VNR, but just anything else that is related to national reporting what are some of the best practices that are being used in those countries that can be applicable? Um, Trinidad and Tobago has benefited from the UN's system financial and logistical support during the preparations of our VNR in 2020. And this was in the height of um, COVID-19 pandemic. So this partnership would have consisted of technical support for the preparation of the report, um, producing a statistical annex and even hosting our stakeholder consultations and even allowing us to use their multimedia facilities. Because at that time when we went, um, the whole world, world went online, a lot of us weren't prepared. But thankfully the UNRC office in Trinidad and Tobago at the time had just installed multimedia facilities in anticipation for um, you know, having to conduct business online now, and we were actually able to use those facilities to present our VNR virtually. So this was a plug here to say that you all have with the UN, you all have been doing some good work. We are grateful and we, you know, hope that it um continues. So thank you. <laughs> no, I'm not finished. I was just saying <laughs> I was just telling the UN thanks. So other stakeholder support, so civil society has always been a key driver and the ones in the forefront in terms of implementation and even reporting on sustainable development initiatives. And 
my colleague from Trinidad and Tobago, she would have mentioned the support that Canary would have given for um, our VNR process. And it was actually something that I did mention in um, my presentation for today that we sometimes we don't realize how much um, civil society um, is an untapped resource that needs to be better utilized, especially in processes like the VNR, because they have a very strong voice. They're on the ground, they're doing the work, and they have information that we need. So when we had our first VNR report, we would have engaged the Caribbean Natural Resource Institute, who prepared a shadow VNR report. And my colleague Will from Climate Analytics would have mentioned that yesterday. So the work in the network on implementing initiatives related to the SDGs was featured in the country's VNR video presentation. And as we go forward, we're hoping to engage um, civil society organizations like Canary and other organizations on the ABAS as well. So the private sector in Trinidad and Tobago has been making strides and implementing initiatives toward integrating sustainability into their corporate portfolio and being more conscious about sustainability. So last year, 2023, the UNRC office would have partnered with a few com um, companies Chamber of Commerce and Associations to offer to the business community a guide to integrating and reporting environmental, social, and governance at the ESG for Trinidad and Tobago companies. So it was an initiative to raise awareness about sustainability responsibility. So the private sector was part of um, our engagement strategy during our VNR process. We would have had um, the consultant that was hired would have done interviews with private sector companies one on one, and they were not oh, not a hundred percent happy with the level of engagement from government and indicated a lack of awareness of government's specific sustainability initiatives. So looking forward, there is room for greater and continuous meaningful engagement during the VNR process with private sector organizations, sharing what our government priorities with respect to what will be reported and work with them to collect data in line with international reporting standards for inclusion in the report. And now that we have the ABAS, it is also another opportunity for us to engage with them on this new um, program of action as well. Academia is a resource that has the capacity to support by providing research and analysis expertise and being an integral part of data collection and evidence-based assessments. So with their support, we ensure a whole of society approach to the VNR process and I mentioned yesterday that we're really hoping to mobilize funding for a project that we want to do with um, the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Campus, one of the um, offices there, so that we can assist and use our local expertise, build capacity as well, because they want to support um, Trinidad and Tobago being um, achieving sustainable development. So recommendations for effective integration, um, integration, capacity building cannot be overemphasized as national focal points. We need this support. So strengthening our capacity to effectively coordinate and mainstream the ABAS nationally will ensure a comprehensive VNR report. Early partnership engagement between the government and the UN system, the multi-country offices, will be important for mapping and mainstreaming of the APAS, assessing readiness and institutional mechanisms, identifying funding sources and other areas of need are some of the key activities that will be required. An area of improvement for us is in raising public awareness on SID's sustainable agenda with a focus on its program of action. So recognizing this, um, I'm hoping that Trinidad and Tobago would be able to put more greater um, efforts to include the ABAS in 
the conversations that we're having with um just nationally and within the national environment um and treating it as a special part of our public awareness campaign especially when we start doing um our vnr and i have a bonus recommendation and i'm just throwing it out there and i'm hoping which i really will catch it <laughs> So I want to propose for consideration having, I know you have the SIDS Global Business Network Forum, and I'm wondering to what extent we can have SIDS National Business Network Forum. So using the Global Business Network Forum and localizing it, um, I think this could be a space for engaging the private sector and other interested stakeholders um, in the Abbas. Thank you, I'm now finished. Thank you so much, Kenneth. I mean, I, we can see that you've put a lot of thought in, into your presentation uh, and we appreciate, uh, you know, your presentation on coherence uh, and integration of ABAS, uh, but also sharing your experience uh, and then proposing, reflecting on the roles of the UN and, and other stakeholders and your experience in Trinidad and Tobago. And I will leave it up to my OHRS colleagues for the consideration of your recommendations. So, um, it's now my pleasure, of course, to turn to our next uh, presenter, uh, Juliet, uh, who we will be all very familiar with uh, from yesterday. Uh, Juliet, of course, is the head of the monitoring and evaluation unit of the Office of the Prime Minister of Vanuatu. So you have the floor, Juliet. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and good every good good everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity for me to share some insights from Vanuatu. Um, I'm actually gonna focus my intervention uh, on maybe just two of the questions from the guiding list that we've given. Um, just some lessons learned and opportunities in implementing some of the best practices um, that we've seen uh, to promote coherence in implementing the SIDS agenda, but also um, I'll be looking a, a bit at the SIDS, sorry, the SDGs through our VNR process. And um, I will actually be focusing a lot of my presentation around uh, reporting and data. So if it's a little bit repetitive or um, an add on to what Chris and some of the other speakers said yesterday, then um, I do apologize. So in July this year, we presented our second um, VNR at the HLPF, and our theme for the second VNR was around strengthening resilience through decentralization, which is, um, as you know, we're all SID states, we have a lot of scattered islands, and uh, in terms of service delivery, it can be quite challenging. And decentralization is a concept or a policy or program and, and a dream of us as a small island state to kind of further those efforts. So I think within the last um, five or six years, um, the last few administrations have really, really tried to push our efforts nationally to bring out decentralization and make that really forefront to what we're doing in terms of our development aspirations. Um, our National Sustainable Development Plan was developed in 2016. And uh, as part of this 15 year plan, we have five year evaluation cycles. So we carried out a first evaluation um, of our NSDP in 2021. And as we were prepping for the second VNR this year, we thought about what we wanted to learn and what we actually wanted to apply from the outcomes of our second VNR. And so we were really thinking about what are the added benefits of conducting a second VNR? I mean, we you shouldn't, I'm a big believer and you shouldn't just be reporting for the sake of reporting. Otherwise, what's the point? It's a waste of money, it's a waste of time and we're all really busy already. So we were really trying to encourage buy-in from all of our stakeholders and think about how can we make the second VNR and that journey and the process and the outcomes more meaningful. So in addition to doing all the normal usual prep that we've all gone through with doing VNRs, we decided that we would also do a bit of a, a data stock take on where we are with our NSDP indicators, but also um, with our related SDG indicators because we'd also localized our SDGs. Uh, we have 196 SDGs for our NSDP and we, we also report on around 185 um, SDG related indicators for our 15 goals. 
So as part of our VNR process, we carried out a data review uh, report. And so we worked very closely with our colleagues from the Vanuatu Bureau of Statistics to do a stock take of all of our national indicators and the, um, the related SDG indicators. And we were able to map everything out and also to update the tables and the NSDP portal that is housed with our Bureau of Statistics, which has all of our NSDP indicators and the corresponding SDG ones. So we really just wanted to find out as, as of 2024, March, where are we with everything? Where is everything housed? Um, what's missing? And also it was a really good opportunity for us to go back and have a look at our baseline um, data for all of our indicators and to see what's missing and what we could update because since um, the NSDP came into effect in 2016, we've had a whole bunch of other um, national surveys and we've had census, we've had HICE, we just had the mix that was done um, 2023 and our latest uh, survey, sorry, our latest census was the agriculture census. And so we were really just trying to use that opportunity um, VNR, but you can kill more than one bird with one stone or something. I think that's the expression. So to kind of do everything all at once, because um, my motto is don't work harder, work smarter. So I think we were really trying to see how we could do that and also pool our resources with where statistics were and they had some money to do that. And we also had a little bit of support for our VNR. So we thought, why don't we try and combine those things to see how we can we can do that and we can have some really good outcomes as a result. So um, while I know that I'm focusing a lot of this on the SDG indicators, I think it's a really timely opportunity for us to have that conversation because we are transitioning from the Samoa pathway into the Abbas and we are also thinking about streamlining and we've heard a lot of the other speakers have said that um, we want to actually build on what we have. So we're really trying to look at that in a very pragmatic way um, and just build on that approach that we've already taken in terms of localizing a lot of those global agendas into what we're doing at the national level and, and, and sub-national level. So I think just building on um, our VNR processes and also what we saw with the outcome of this data review report, I just wanted to share some of um, the lessons and maybe just provide some points that we can think on um, as we go forward with the ABBAS and the Yemeni framework. So I think my colleague has already mentioned a lot. She spoke, uh, you know, quite eloquently about the need for aligning national reporting and policies to what we're doing at the sub-regional, regional level, but also the international platforms and partnerships. Um, and, you know, like other countries, we've also tried to look at how we can streamline our national data or national reporting to what we're doing at the global level as well. So um, I think it's really important to um, to support some of the, the words that our other colleagues have said since we came into this meeting. They've raised the importance of the commissions, the RCOs, and, you know, there's a lot of call for regional support um, and how regional agencies, including crop agencies, it's good to see PIFS is here, um, SBC was here yesterday, and um, MSG at the back. The role in supporting ABAS, building on best practices, um, also helping us to access and utilize appropriate technology that we can we can use, um, building on capacity and also knowledge sharing and transfer is really important. We have a lot of resourceful people um, in all of our countries at different levels. It's it's just a question of how do you how do you get access to those people? How do you invite them to the table? Um, and how can their agencies and capabilities help to transform um, some of these things into you know actionable agendas for the future? So um, it's also really important in terms of how um, they can assist SIDS countries with, in terms of building reporting, but also in terms of data collection. Um, as long as it's based on relevancy, it, it looks at what our capacities are on the ground and we have the ability to capture baseline information and metadata that speaks to our actual development um, agendas as well. Um, another example, and I don't wanna bore everybody because I know it's almost lunchtime, is the use of proxies. So, you know, one of the things that we have when we talk about indicators is sometimes there's no information available, you don't have baseline data. So instead of being able to measure something very specific, you would look at something that is quite closely related. Um, some of those things, and I'm talking very practically about some of the capacities that we might not have, and this is something or an area where um, perhaps we could see the um, 
regional organizations, the commissions as well, the um, RCOs coming in to, to further support SIDS. Um, yesterday in session two, we talked a lot about a potential core set of um, SIDS indicators for us to build upon. And this is probably something where we would also seek um, support or we could practically seek support from regional commissions and the um, RCO offices and the other crop agencies that are in the room. And it would be really great to see how we can turn that from maybe a conversation into things that are more tangible that we can um, even factor into a timeline like one of the other NFPs mentioned in their presentation yesterday. I think something that I would also like to highlight here is around capacities. And uh, my colleague from Mauritius mentioned this slightly yesterday in one of his interventions, and it's something that we've thought a lot about. Uh, and maybe uh, going forward, we could, if, if it's possible at all, this could be something that the IATF also considers in uh, in the timeline or in the scope of work that they're looking at. So when I'm talking about capacities, I, I guess I'm speaking specifically about the difference or the diversity between all the SIDS and just looking around the room here, we all have very different capacities in terms of human resources. We have some countries where they have huge statistics offices or they have big planning offices or they have a lot of people. And then other countries in this region where there's one or two people and that's the entire stats office. So I guess in terms of how we practically and pragmatically look at what an m and &E framework should be like, we should also take some time to have a bit of a stock take or think about what the different SIDS capabilities are, not just by sub-region, but also country to country and how we're actually going to be able to manage things. And then kind of factoring that into our planning on what um, an m and &E framework would be like. So I, I think maybe that could be something that if the... Um, the IATF and and how we how we design our M and E framework. We could also be thinking about um, what the SIDS capabilities are and how we could uh, factor that in. This could also be an area that we might seek support through our um, regional agencies and uh, and crop agencies and regional commissions. Not to put more work on you guys, but I mean we are trying to talk a lot about what we mean by meaningful partnerships and and how we actually do things in a very uh, actionable way so you know these these things they sound simple um they probably require a little bit of to and fro and 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 collaborative efforts but um it, it's probably something that's a bit easier for us to achieve than some of the other things that we're talking about that are still at a very um high level and my last point um I think is, is really around the importance of supporting and enhancing national systems and building on the governance that um, countries try their best to develop. And I think it's 2024 now, and just listening to some of the presentations that have come, especially from the NFPs and listening to a lot of the really good lessons and um, really positive developments that our respective countries have made um, to date with regards to policy, planning and reporting structures um, that really showcase and build on national capacities. You can see that there have been technological advances, there's innovation there, um, and there's also greater stakeholder engagement where there's really, really concerned efforts to, to make that better, you know, and we're showcasing greater and meaningful stakeholder engagement participation. Um, and these are things that um, are wins for us. I mean, we are developing states, but in, in many ways, you can see that there's been a lot of progress. So I would just like to encourage us, and it's great to see that there are um, quite a few partners around the, in the room with us today, just in terms of when it comes to financing and resourcing for um, SIDS implementation and even SDGs, um, it's definitely an area where I would really like to see that our partners are able to build up, to build on those those support systems. Um, sometimes you don't necessarily need to come in and build a brand new database or a portal or a system. You can actually just have a look at what the Ministry of Finance has already done, what they're doing with that sort of data and assist them specifically with what they might need because that's already costed. It's already part of their recurrent budget. They're already doing that. They have people in place. They just probably need a bit more help in some very specific areas. So I think just trying to encourage um, some of the, the ways that we can actually work together on implementation um, having a look and and really trying to support and enhancing um, national systems. And it's also really important because, um, you know, while it might not look 
fun or it doesn't photograph as well if you just have a picture of a um, a book versus um, you know cutting a ribbon on a bridge or something which is also important don't get me wrong but I think it's also really important because um, investing in national systems um, are, are are important because they're built by and with our people it also highlights that these are actually our capabilities um, these are the resources that we have. This is the context that we live in, including our climates, um, the ge different geographical um, nature of where we live, live, and also our unique um, cultures. So um, I think if we're really talking about practical ways that we can start to make inroads to implementing um, the SIDS agenda, maybe this is probably something that we can we can have a look at. Um, so I think um, with that, Madam Chair, uh, that's, that's the end of my brief reflections, and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Juliet, yep. uh, for your reflections, particularly sharing with us the experience of Vanuatu uh, and the need really for us, as you said, to be practical and not reinvent the wheel and, and work with what we already have. Um, so, colleagues, we will have two lead discussions before we. I will open up uh, the floor for uh, discussions. Um, and our first lead discussant uh, is uh, Kenroy Roach, uh, who we all know, of course, from the UNRCO of Barbados uh, and the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, so, Ken, I will now give you the floor and just remind you, you have seven minutes. Testing. Thank you. Okay, I think it's um, we're good. Thank you, Madam Moderator. It's a real privilege to be here, and I think my intervention is actually perfectly timed, given the into the last comments from Kenithia, um, tasking the resident coordinator office to do a number of very important things. Um, again, just to express the appreciation to uh, Vanuatu for the hospitality, and um, really to OHR LLS for showing leadership in, in, in bringing the resident coordinator system on board and, and engaged in this meeting. So thank you very much. Um, I, I want to focus a little bit in uh, on the sort of practical side of things, um, building a bit on what Ambassador Lucero said this morning and, and some of the recent comments. Um, so my comments are going to be more around how do we practically take the ABAS implementation forward and hopefully to put some proposals and some ideas uh, on the table that um, OHR LLS, but more importantly, the National Focal Point Network can consider in terms of how we how we move forward. The first thing I want to really note is that, um, you know, achieving the coherent implementation of ABAS, which has been a team well articulated in the concept note, will require a different way of working and it will require more collaboration. And I would dare say leveraging more economies of scale simply because we're speaking about small island developing states with very limited capacities. And so I think um, as we go forward, we really need to think about how do we uh, bring the islands together more, bring their capacities more to do work more jointly but that's also relevant for us in the UN system and, and looking at how we facilitate more integration and coherent policy advice from the UN agencies, funds and programs. So um, really thinking practically about how we come together and how we provide support to countries to deliver on, on the ABAS. And that um, I, would, I, I would argue would require integrated and coherent um, tools, sustainable development policy tools that shows countries how we can really take forward many of the recommendations and many of those and the 10 areas that have been put forward um, in, in the ABAS. 
um, the next slide. So one of the practical things that I wanted to suggest uh, in the spirit of this session, which focuses so much on effective practices and, and lessons learned, is really um, the UN system working together with each of the 38 SIDS to look at how to develop and integrate the ABAS into existing um, national plans and policies and, and systems. And, and the, the way, I, and, and this is built on the experience of how the UN came together on the SDGs. And I wanted to propose these six steps um, that we can look at through some, what I'm calling an integrated mission, meaning UN agencies coming together, joining hands and working with each SID, bringing their capacities and comparative advantages together to look at uh, how to support landing the ABBA. So the first step really, and Kenichi, you spoke to this very well, is the alignment, which is an assessment of the extent to which the ABAS is already integrated into existing plans and strategies, because there are many things in the ABAS that countries are already working on. Um, there are many things in the ABAS that are deeply linked to the SDG agenda. So it's not that we are countries are starting from scratch. So the first place to start really is to take an account of where are countries with respect to the implementation of those commitments that have been made and identify those gaps. So I think an alignment exercise, bringing the collective capacities of agencies together would be a very uh, good place to start. And then secondly, looking at this important issue of how do you break down um, silos? How do you actually really help with the integration through coordination mechanisms at the national level. And what this really means is, and uh, again, the intervention from Trinidad spoke to this, looking at ways to build into ministerial coordination, collaboration at the national level, and looking at what are those mechanisms, but also other stakeholders. How do you bring other um, uh, actors, private sector, and, and other important actors on to the table to look at how to support the implementation of the ABAS. And I think that's something that can be done very practically. And there are many examples of how that has been done uh, for, for example, an SDG implementation. The third is um, really moving from planning to action. And I wanted to come in after the presentation from um, Antigua on the SIT Center of Excellence. Um, and and the, and some of the comments made. I think there are many, again, there are many good ideas for what needs to be done. But then we also know in a resource constrained, fiscal constrained environment, there are perhaps some things that are accelerators. There are things that if you invest in those areas, you can have a domino effect across other um, objectives and targets. And I think the UN system can really look at supporting uh, the SIDS in identifying where are those entry points for delivering, turning the 10 um, sort of buckets or, or, or key areas for action into practical steps. Where are the accelerators that can be invested in at the national level? And then, of course, um, on financing, uh, we haven't talked uh, much about the integrated national financing frameworks, which is a very important tool for looking at fiscal space um, within countries, identifying uh, options for financing both international and domestic, public and private, and really helping SITS to think about the question of, okay, given those gaps that we've identified from the first exercise, and those accelerators or the priorities that need to now be addressed, how do we actually finance those needs? Uh, and again, looking at domestic resources, and there's a lot to be discussed in terms of domestic um, uh, financing, both from public and private, but also international public and, uh, and private. And I think the whole concept of um, partnerships that we'll be discussing to, uh, very soon will become an important element of that because it will give a clear indication to the international partners and where those gaps are and where their investments can best add value given um, the needs on the ground. 
the fifth element is on the monitoring and reporting. And, and we've talked a lot about this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, strengthening data ecosystems. Integrating ABAS into VNR reporting, I think, is a brilliant idea. Um, but really looking at the existing reporting mechanisms and ensuring that as a matter of policy, ABAS and the reflection and with the development of the ME framework and hopefully with closing some of the data gaps, which is why I included the strengthening the data ecosystem, because unless you have the data, you cannot really report on it. So the data um, system coupled with the reporting are some important elements and the regional commissions, for example, have a lot of experience around um, strengthening statistical systems that can be leveraged um, and other parts of the UN system, I, I would also add. And finally, the element of advocacy and partnership. And again, this has been coming up based on those gaps. What are the sort of partnerships that need to be thought of to, to take the um, ABAS forward. The other, um, the other part of this that I, as a final comment um, from, the, from my side. So as we all know, next year will be the financing, the fourth financing for development conference in Spain. And I believe firmly that there is a real opportunity given the work done around the MVI, given the thinking done around um, the financing for development needs of SIDS, for us to think about practically what are the, um, where are the interventions and where are the entry points for addressing some of those financing needs that can be brought um, to the um, Spain meeting. In the Eastern Caribbean, what you're seeing on the slide here is an attempt by the UN system, funds and programs coming together to think through how can the UN system support each country, each SID, in translating their financing needs? And um, we framed it more broadly around the SDGs and identified those four areas, um, policy and regulatory frameworks, capacity building, pipeline of national projects, and what and the last one, which we call convening the deal room with investors, commercial finance, uh, multilateral development banks, and IFIs. And if we go to the second slide, the next slide, um, we are proposing to do this in each country in three areas. And I think this is something we may want to look into more. This is just an example. Um, the first is around climate finance, looking at opportunities around um, providing technical assistance in developing um, the pipeline of projects, bank of projects, supporting advocacy on the loss and damage fund and its capitalization, strengthening SIDS knowledge on, the, on carbon markets and how to interact and engage in carbon markets, supporting SIDS in getting national institutions accredited so that they can be able to access the GCF and some of the other funds, the vertical funds. Um, and in innovative finance, um, looking at opportunities around private equity, looking at opportunities around um, guarantees and, 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 and catalytic financing, looking at opportunities around green technology, fintech, agricultural insurance. These are areas where a number of UN agencies do have uh, capacity and have worked and could come together um, as part of this roadmap that I'm suggesting, this process that I'm suggesting to provide very targeted and um, practical assistance to SIDS so that we can open up access to um, innovative finance, but also climate finance. And it would, it would be remiss if I didn't mention public financial management, because this is an area we don't talk a lot about, but I think there is need for support. Uh, issues around fiscal forecasting, issues around how do you structure blended financing arrangements, uh, obviously debt management strategies and so forth. And again, um, looking practically at providing this support. So I think um, to conclude, going back to where I started, through more integrated policy and technical support, bringing the entire system together 
to reduce the burden on SIDS to have to work with each entity at a time, but really coming together from the get-go, I think it's a really good opportunity for um, turning the ABAS and the objectives and the ambition of the ABAS into some practical steps. So I'll leave it there and I'm happy to interact more on these points. Thank you very much, uh, Kenroy. So we have our final uh, uh, discussant, and that and she will is Miss Suella Hansen, uh, who is, as I think uh, Tishka mentioned earlier, she's an OHRLS consultant uh, on digitalization, uh, and uh, Suella will be presenting uh, online. So Suella, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, we can. Yes, Thank, can. You Thank you very much. much. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Can you see that? Is it visible? Okay, thank you very much. And um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, I'm very sorry that I'm not um, there with you in, in Vanuatu, um, but it, it looks like you're having a really productive um, conference. So I undertook a study um, on behalf of um, the United Nations um, in Kiribati. And the objective of the study was to explore progress um, with introducing and adopting digital technologies and the remaining um, challenges for further advancement into the digital world. Um, I have to preface this um, presentation um, by saying that um, I didn't actually go to Kiribati. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't sufficient budget um, with this project to make a visit to Kiribati. Um, but fortunately, I had been um, to Kiribati um, on, a, on a World Bank project some years earlier. So I did um, have an understanding of, of the culture and um, some of the, the challenges that were, were facing the communication sector um, back then. So it, it, it was interesting for me personally to see um, what changes had occurred over the last 10 years. Um, and um, particularly where things stood with the outer islands, because my job 10 years ago with the World Bank was, was to cost an intervention um, in the outer islands um, to improve or, or to create um, communications channels, which weren't there at all in some cases 10 years ago. So I looked at... Um, the digital supporting environment. And there were three main areas I considered. First of all, um, the enabling framework. Secondly, um, access and connectivity. And thirdly, what digital initiatives were going on. Um, of course, for digital trans transformation, all of these elements are important. So just, just to put in, in context um, where um, Kiribati lies in comparison with um, Pacific neighbors and the SIDS average, this is uh, the percentage of individuals using the internet. And you'll see that um, the, the green bar is Kiribati, which is, is just over 50%. So significantly below the SIDS average and below many um, of the other countries, um, of the other Pacific neighboring countries. As far as affordability is concerned, um, and this is ITU data again, um, broadband services are still relatively unaffordable in Kiribati compared to benchmarks, and certainly compared to the Broadband Commission's 2% target. So you'll see that Kiribati is around about 5% um, of GNI um, being spent on broadband services. 
so not surprisingly, um, affordability um, remains a barrier for many in Kiribati. And um, just going back to Dominic's presentation earlier today, um, he emphasized the importance still of affordability. And, and sadly, that was an issue 10 years ago when I, when I was actually in Kiribati. Still, the price of devices um, is very high in relation to income there. Um, some people, um, if they don't have a job, they, they can't afford a device or um, a mobile service. However, there are, are some developments going on there. Um, there are two cable, submarine cable um, projects um, in the works. Uh, one has already landed in one of the island groups. There are three island groups and they're very, very widely dispersed geographically. So one has landed already in Kiramati and um, another one is coming next year to the main center in South Tarawa. So it's, it's hoped that with those submarine cables coming um, online, the cost of bandwidth is going to decline. Um, in, in addition to that, uh, new um, improved satellite service options are becoming available now. And um, again, there is a hope that with increasing competition, um, the cost of bandwidth is going to decline. Now, looking at the enabling environment um, for digital transformation in Kiribati, um, it was clear that since 2019, a lot of progress has been made. Um, there are um, strategies and plans, action plans that have been drawn up and um, put into practice and also um, associated legislation has been passed to support um, appropriate governance for digital development. Um, most importantly, a digital transformation office has been set up and that acts as a, a center of excellence. It's its main um, responsibility at the moment is to guide um, digital initiatives, particularly in relation to e-government, so initiatives in the public service. Um, but it's also um, encouragingly um, being engaged in community outreach to promote digital literacy and knowledge. I spoke to many government ministries in the course of the study and public organizations. All of them um, are still at a relatively early stage in the um, movement towards digitalization. Um, and some of the um, sectors are still actually um, at the planning stage only. So there, there's a, a long way to go, but what impressed me was that there was a really strong understanding of what the opportunities um, that digitalization um, and digital development can bring. Um, that was clear in, in most departments I spoke to, most ministries. Um, there was an appreciation of the improvements in efficiency and competitiveness, and not just in a general sense, but very specific um, ideas about how this would help in their ministries. Um, and also, of course, um, a very good understanding of, of the possibilities for economic and social well-being um, through digital development. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there is um, there are improvements coming with, with connectivity, um, and this is a, a real precondition for digital transformation. The submarine cables will make a difference that, that they are key milestones, as I've described there. Um, but at the same time, um, the outer islands will never have cables um, realistically. So they will continue to rely on satellite and in some instance, microwave services. Um, so someone mentioned earlier um, uh, that no one had, had, had talked about satellite, um, but I want to emphasize that um, it, it's critical for these outer islands and Kiribati and many other Pacific islands, um, which will not, um, it's just not economic given their geographical circumstances and the demographics um, for them to have cable. 
uh, finally, um, and this was a problem 10 years ago and it persists now, there's a lack of access to reliable power supply in many, many areas. And I'm not just talking about the outer islands. Um, there were power, power outages in um, South Tarawa, which is the main um, centre, um, which took down the internet for a long period um, very recently. So th that is an ongoing problem, an ongoing challenge, really. Um, not only is there uh, an unreliable power supply, but there's also an over-reliance on imported fuel. And that fuel um, often is irregular in its supply, particularly to the outer island. So that's that's an ongoing challenge. Now, I, as I said, I spoke to um, many um, ministries and agencies, and I just thought I'd, I'd touch on um, fisheries because this is um, absolutely key in terms of the economic well-being in Kiribati. It's one of their, it is their main industry, fisheries. So in the fisheries um, department there, the government has a lot of um, digital initiatives and plans. Um, they are at the moment developing a digital licensing system, which will support up-to-date data and it, as part of that, they will have a modeling and forecasting capacity. And then they have many hopes and plans and aspirations for digital um, initiatives, including um, the use of blockchain technology, which they see as, as being able to improve their efficiencies within the supply chain. And also um, they have hopes of using that to develop aquaculture. They want to build internal reporting capabilities and they want to adopt digital platforms that'll facilitate effective cross-sectoral engagement in the blue economy. So these last three points are really um, aspirations rather than what's happening at the moment. So what are the main challenges um, they are facing in, in implementing and accessing these types of initiatives? The number one one was the in, inadequate digital infrastructure. Um, and they are, they are all hoping that will be solved when the cable arrives in Tarawa. But the other big one, and, and this has already been talked about quite a lot um, today already, is the lack of human capacity. So it was clear um, that they, there is a need there to train staff and colleagues in new digital systems and applications. And secondly, um, there was recognition that they didn't have the required expertise in the country um, to establish the systems which they want to establish um, and to put in place um, all of these uh, initiatives. So in other words, a technical expertise is required from outside um, in order to provide the training and capacity building which will support these initiatives. So finally, um, how can um, Kiribati's participation in the digital world be advanced? It was very clear that further technical assistance for training government staff in new digital tools and applications is absolutely essential. So that's at the government level. But I, I also spoke to many in the private sector and it, it became clear that for, the, for those individuals and groups, programs are necessary to create opportunities to improve digital literacy and skills which are important for digital inclusion. Um, at the moment, Kiribati is still largely um, a paper-based and cash um, economy. So that's the, the transactions um, are usually conducted this way. And in order to, to take advantage of digital solutions, it's necessary to build digital trust so people are, are happy to move from those traditional ways of doing business. And finally, the promotion of digital initiatives, particularly relating to e-commerce, um, will be pivotal 
in advancing the new opportunities um, which digital transformation offers. Now, I didn't mention explicitly um, uh, NFPs, but I have to say that um, without the NFP um, in Kiribati, I would not have been able to conduct the study remotely. Um, it just would have been impossible. That NFP in Kiribati um, was excellent with communications and she was able to quickly identify um, who I needed to speak to um, and, and set up meetings, um, follow up for me. Um, so um, full credit to that NFP and I came to appreciate the value of NFPs um, through the efforts of that um, that good lady in Kiribati. Um, so uh, that's all I have to say. Um, I hope that was useful um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. about the challenges we still continue to face uh, in some of our member countries. So colleagues, uh, we are, we have about 15 minutes officially before lunch, but with your indulgence, depending on the interest, maybe we can break for lunch. I'm looking at our chief organizer <laughs> at quarter to one, uh, but as I said, we'll judge the, the interest in, in uh, the discussion. So the floor is, is open. Uh, please, you know, put your sign up and then we will go around the room. So the first, uh, like Vanuatu private sector, thanks. I'd like to take this opportunity to um, um, give my opinion of uh, what has worked for us in Vanuatu and um, um, the progress that we can move forward. I will be uh, uh, giving an intervention in the afternoon, so I will uh, uh, continue more in depth there. Um, one thing that I wanted to note is that um, the ITU has uh, indicated that the first uh, infrastructure that needs to be put forth is the digital infrastructure for connectivity. And uh, that being set forth, then the other SDGs can catch up to it. Um, next, I also like to say that, for example, UNCDF has put forth a study for Vanuatu in which e-money, if implemented, can immediately improve our GDP by one to two percent. So that is a twenty million US dollar translation for us every year. So that's very meaningful for connectivity in our island. What I've learned is uh, when I have. Uh, uh, started uh, three link uh, in 2020 was that uh, uh, connectivity was really important to be put in the remote islands, but it needs three pillars. It needs not just broadband, uh, but also it needs content, and uh, it needs um, another pillar, which is uh, uh, the sustainability of the community to maintain this connectivity. And so this is really important for the data collection or participation, especially in the informal sector. Uh, Vanuatu is agriculture based and also for ecotourism, uh, a lot of uh, data can be collected by local uh, micro um, entrepreneurs. And um, so I'd like to just reiterate that if we do make a step forward uh, today, I, we've mentioned uh, data, we've mentioned uh, infrastructure, and, but a lot of these have legal implications that stop the progress. For example, connectivity is actually ruled by the licensing of every nation. So not everyone can be a player, for example. And big telcos have their particular um, uh, responsibility to their shareholders. So that needs to be navigated. It's the licensing. The next is in terms of data. Um, we need the data scientists to be able to uh, ethically navigate uh, what is data that we can collect. Uh, that will populate the fields that we need. And uh, we have these off-shelf products that are already available, 
um, that we don't have to reinvent. So this is not a dream, it's actually available. So with the use of AI, and uh, we could even our youth <laughs> with the connectivity and capacity training, they could build agents to then you know, further create or seek data um, that uh, really um, substantiate um, their particular needs in their country. Because every SIDS nation, we are in different development paths and we have different development needs. Uh, the Pacific SIDS, we really do need that connectivity and it seems oversimplified, uh, but that is our first step forward. So thank you. Um, thank you, Andy. Uh, just giving others time to collect their thoughts. Um, just wanted to say that note has been taken of the um, challenges given to OHRLS from both Trinidad and Tobago, as well as the RCO office, Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. Um, we, this is what this meeting is for, to care these um, suggestions and recommendations. Can, you can, okay, and see how best we can take them forward. So this will all be um, a part of our discussions going forward and taking note of, of, of the very useful comments and um, recommendations that you have made. Um, so th th we, will, we will be working on and just wanted to say that. And, and hopefully, in, as I speak, others um, can come with their thoughts and recommendations as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tishka. I'm just checking. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I was particularly um, impressed in, uh, by, by the presentation made by uh, all of the colleagues here, but in particular, um, the one by the, the discussant, Dr. Hansen. And um, I, I noted the use of uh, blockchain and digital technology in uh, the management of our fisheries resources. I think this is something that uh, we uh, is possible. We should be able to to share as we all want to develop our fisheries and ocean resources in a sustainable manner and make the most of what we have. I mean, we, we talk about IUU at the FAO. We even talk about the IUU at the WTO, uh, you know, the fisheries subsidy agreement. Uh, so uh, um, I, I would uh, request our last speaker, if possible, to to share a bit more about uh, what uh, uh, she has done on uh, on on, on uh, the use of uh, blockchain and digital technology. Um, I, I think I noted. Uh, in the management of supply chain, aquaculture, and reporting. But it, it's also about uh, IUU. I think uh, that's very important. Talk, she did mention about e-licensing system. Um, so I, I would be uh, very grateful if, if you could uh, share a bit more. So, Sue Ellen, are you still on? Yeah. So just, just before I give her the floor, just to let you know that I know, for example, and unfortunately there's nobody here from Fiji, but that Fiji has been using the, the blockchain technology and there's a local company that's basically developed, uh, is quite useful. And uh, we also do have a, in the Pacific, a foreign fisheries agency who helps with, you know, IUU. Um, and they have a very uh, good uh, vessel monitoring system, uh, you know, which is pretty impressive. So um, I'm just looking. So, is did you want um, su uh, did you want uh, Suella to respond now, or for her to just share something online about the blockchain technology? Yeah. So maybe I'll ask Suella to just you know share with OHRLS the the blockchain technology, so that other people in the room can also have the opportunity, uh, you know, to to speak. Okay. Carry on, please. Yeah. 
Thank you, madam. I just wanted to come in and uh, uh, I totally agree that um, the infrastructure and, and and it has a ripple effect, effect on the other industries as well. And I would like to highlight the point that um, uh, when it comes to technology and the transformation, uh, private sector plays a key role in uh, bringing up the ch about the change because they are always looking into efficiency and making it more effective. But that's where the government comes in to support and complement these initiatives and uh, support, uh, help uh, build on what they are uh, pushing for, especially uh, when it comes to e-commerce and uh, things like that. So government is more of a facilitator and uh, it's a, they should like jump in to the um, initiatives driven by the, uh, the private sector. So like what we have seen in the Maldives is like where the SMEs uh, are more easily adaptable to these e-commerce, smaller businesses uh, were more, um, uh, adaptable to the these changes where larger uh, businesses were not able to easily change to the transaction. So these kind of things, uh, uh, we really need, uh, we really see things that we really didn't com uh, totally uh, predict how this would work. And uh, also uh, uh, the legal systems and the, I couldn't agree more on that. And of course, the challenges of uh, integration and also uh, digital literacy, all these are coming in. So government really needs to uh, make intervention, timely interventions to uh, uh, address these issues that uh, really come in place or fill the gaps that the, the private sector is not able to uh, carry on. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that as well. And investing in technology is as important as investing in other infrastructure as well. And it really would have a ripple effect on the industries like health, education, uh, and many more agriculture, fisheries, uh, all that as well. Thank you. Just checking if anybody else would like to speak. Um, if not, I know that we have people online that have also put their hands up. So I just want to check before we go online. Okay. So, Anjish, if you're still online, I'll give you the floor now. Thank you, Mod. Thank you, moderator. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the very good presentations made by speakers in this session. Um, I, I, I wanted to just oh, highlight, just highlight. Um, a, a few points, if that's okay. Uh, mainly to say that, um, as, as my coll as our colleague uh, Ken Roy Rogue said. We're not starting from scratch, uh, and a lot of work in the Pacific Seeds have been done to integrate and localize the MDGs and the SDGs, as well as some more pathway before uh, a bus. And um, I'd like to also suggest, say that the six steps highlighted by um, Mr. Roach was helpful because these are the points that have been identified as accelerators for the SDGs, and they also can be applied in the case of a bus. So um, just to give some examples of some work ESCAP's done uh, to support the UN offer uh, as, a, as, a, as part of the UN offer uh, to support Pacific Seeds, um, We've sort of worked a lot in the in area of integrated planning and alignment of the agendas. And one of the key areas of work has been, for example, ensuring there is coherence within the national planning processes, which include sector plans, corporate plans, and, even, and eventually the budget. So thank you, for, uh, Mr. Conroy, for also highlighting uh, the 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 need for that integration. Um, and the first three points on your six steps 
six first three steps of the six uh, three steps of the six uh, very much areas where SCAPs worked. For example, linking plans to budgets. SCAP in the Pacific seeds has worked extensively with the IMF and other partners to support strengthening those linkages. More recently, SCAP has worked in some countries, particularly. Uh, and I hope Vanuatu doesn't uh, mind uh, me mentioning, but we tailored the national planning framework also uh, to, to make sure that there is better um, efficiency and coherence. Uh, another area where I could mention, I wanted to mention work, uh, uh, which Mr. Conroy highlighted was, you know, strengthening project planning systems and improving investment pipelines. We've got in both uh, this area as well as strengthening uh, linkages between plans and budgets, guidance notes specifically for Pacific seeds, uh, noting the capacity challenges in Pacific seeds. So I think it's been um, you know a lot of effort that's gone into a lot of these areas, and um, possibly we can share this with the secretariat um, just to 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 have as a resource as well. But these are very important areas of work, which um, I think eventually um, uh, could support better implementation, um, as highlighted in Mr. Con uh, Mr. Roach's six steps. Uh, and and I and I could say here also that it'd be good for uh, the UN system to strengthen the offer in the various subregions, including the Caribbean and PCs, by um, by having um, a kind of a consolidated um, offer from the various agencies so we can be more effective in our support. My last word on this, if I can, and, and maybe um, this may come up later, um, uh, but they would be really good to have some consensus on the changes between the Samoa pathway and the bus. Uh, that will help a lot of the countries, but also the partners to to identify clear entry points that need integration. Uh, as we said before, we're not starting from scratch. So a lot of the Samoa pathway issues may have been integrated already. So it'd be really good to understand what are the clear entry points uh, that need further integration um, within the planning framework and, and the budgets eventually. Um, these will lead to better implementation and, of course, better results. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for the opportunity. Speak. Seems not. I think we're all eager to have lunch. So I'll hand over to our Chief Organiser again, Silva. Okay, thank you very much, um, Madam Moderator. Please give her, everyone a round of applause. Um, so, good news. All of you staying here are checking out at 12 o'clock. Yay. So, um, I told you we had soft power. Um, so, we'll break for lunch now, and then we'll report back at, uh, say, quarter to two, and then we'll make a two o'clock uh, prop star. Um, so enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Lunch will be served in the same uh, the same restaurant. Most of you had your breakfast.